Well, welcome everybody that is joining our webinar today with Worldwide Health Staff Solutions. We're so excited to have you here. We're really excited to have a great discussion today. I'm super excited to introduce you to Carnegie Evaluations. Um, Carnegie Evaluations and Worldwide Health Staff Solutions have been partnering for over three years um, and have made an excellent team. We're so excited about the great work that they do for all of our nurses and our nurse aides um, around the globe. And so today you get to meet some very special people. I'm excited to introduce them to you today. So the first person that I get to introduce is Zach Zachariah. Let me share a little bit about him. Zach is an associate professor at Liberty University. He is the Director of Client Services for Carnegie Evaluations and is also the Director of, for the Center of Supply Chain Research and is so knowledgeable on this subject. And then also joining us today is Reno Chirian. She is the Operations Manager for Carnegie Evaluations. So before I turn it over to Zach, please share with us in the chat. You have a chat feature and we want to know more about who's joining us today, more about who's going to be participating. Please let us know in the comments, where are you joining us from? Where in the world are you joining us from? And then also, are you in the process of becoming, um, going through immigration as a registered nurse or as a nurse aide or another profession? Um, we'd love to hear that. Um, feedback from you. And we are here to answer a lot of your questions. There is a Q&A feature that you can also ask questions throughout it. Our wonderful case manager, um, Amy Reisman, is going to be answering your questions throughout the chat, but we're going to make sure that we have time at the end to answer any questions that you may have. So Zach, welcome today to our webinar. We're so excited to have you join us. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Beth. I really appreciate that. I, I will say that it's Lehigh University. Lehigh, sorry. <laughs> Lehigh University. No worries. Yeah. <laughs> no worries at all. You know, I, I just want to make sure I'm still in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. You know, um, so I'm going to uh, just go to the next slide and uh, take a minute to sort of introduce um, Carnegie uh, to, to all of you, you know, um, and uh, our focus today on understanding your educational and credential evaluations. As Beth mentioned, uh, I'm a director here at Carnegie Evaluations. And before we get into the academic evaluations, which is the majority of this presentation, I just want to take a brief minute to introduce Carnegie Evaluations to you. Uh, we have been in AILA, um, and AILA stands for American Immigration Lawyers Association, supporter for many years. And uh, this year we are a 2023 platinum supporter. We are really well known for our quality and quick turnaround in evaluations. And this has led to over 580 Google reviews that has rated us, you know, five stars. We have professors from top ranked universities from all over the US that can provide an expert opinion in over 100 and 25 specialties. They really provide a thorough and in-depth analysis that has proven to be very helpful in the petition process. As that, and as you can see, I'm sort of working my way across the slide from left to right. We provide over 15 different types of services, including EB1, EB2, L1, TN, and so on. And as you can see, this is, uh, uh, we've got a list of the many things that clients rely on us. Um, you know, we have over a thousand law firms who are our clients and we continue to grow primarily by referrals. They recommend our service to their clients. And because of, because we have, as I've said before, we've known for our quality, our quick turnaround and our wide range of services. So with that quick overview, I'd like to ask our manager of operations, Reno Cherian, to discuss academic uh, evaluations. Hi, everyone. Good morning to you from New Jersey. Uh, good uh, evening, good afternoon from wherever you have joined. If it doesn't work, just greetings to all of you. Um, academic evaluations, that's the topic of our uh, webinar today. Um, as Zach has said, we have done academic evaluations from the time we started. 
um, and it is more than five years now, and uh, we have done thousands of them. Uh, we have done uh, evaluations for foreign education from different parts of the world, Asia, Southeast Asia, Middle East Asia, uh, Europe, Eastern Europe, um, and of course, South America, Mexico and Canada as well. But yes, um, a big shout out to WWHS for introducing us to Africa, the continent that we hadn't been to. Uh, it is so much fun, Beth, to know about the small countries that we haven't even heard of and getting to know about the education systems of those countries. Um, you know, it is, it is really fun. And we have a team that takes care of all the emails and all the intakes. And it is, you know, we, we talk uh, to each other about the different countries. Oh, my God, Malawi is, how is it? Talk? I mean, we don't even know how to express it correctly and to know so much about the culture and the education system of that country. It is so enriching. And thank you for that. Um, so we have provided uh, many thousands of academic evaluations. And in the recent years, as uh, Zach said uh, and Beth said, uh, for the last three years, we have been concentrating on nursing evaluations per se. So a number of evaluations, a number of scenarios, a number of different kind of education systems. So yes, we do present a lot of um, experience today and, um, and we are very happy to share with you all. So uh, since we are talking about academic evaluations, um, academic evaluations are required uh, for people who are coming into the US uh, with some kind of a knowledge-based activity in their, in, their, uh, uh, in their future, right? So it could be for education. Yes, somebody has come down from some other country and wanting to pursue something um, higher, definitely the university will want to know as to what you have done in your native land. So of course, education. Employment, particularly government-based agencies, they do require um, credential evaluations for educations that you have pursued in, uh, in a foreign land. Licensing, you're all nurses, so you definitely know that with licensing. Yes, you require um, academic evaluations. I have put uh, immigration at the end because that's the place that we come into. Um, uh, we do provide uh, um, academic evaluations and our academic evaluations are targeted for USCIS based um, uh, requirements. So um, we cater, I mean, we are, our, our academic evaluations are tailored to the needs of immigration. There are clients who come to us seeking information whether these academic evaluations can be submitted for licensing, can be submitted for employment. Yes, you can. You can contact your agency and give them these, provide them these. And if that is acceptable, good for you. Uh, but yes, uh, our evaluations are, are created in such a way that they are USCIS RFE proof. So that is the base idea when we create our academic evaluations. Coming to the next slide. Yes, because we are talking about uh, immigration, so so it does make sense to actually have a look at the USCIS policy for um, academic evaluations for uh, from foreign lands. Um, so um, it is very clearly etched out in the policy. Uh, but I would like to draw your attention to a few things in this policy, which basically uh, draws the basis for all the all the academic evaluations, the requirement for academic evaluations. So yes, uh, the, the first uh, thing that I would like to draw your attention to is what's the goal of an academic evaluation? As it is very clearly said, it is equivalency determination. So um, this method, that method, there are different types of evaluation, but the end goal at the, you know, the outcome has to be a, a US-based equivalency determination. That is the idea for um, an academic evaluation. Who can do it? It is usually an independent credentials evaluator, and Carnegie is one such. It can also be done by a school official, and it is for this reason that all our academic evaluations are provided by professors and professors alone, uh, so, so that we fit into both these criteria that USCIS's policy outlines. Um, okay. Uh, what does um, USCIS look into besides the academic evaluation? So USCIS officers do, do go through uh, all your documents, all your uh, education credentials besides the evaluation. So this is, this is important and I would like to stress upon this. So when we get a request from one of our clients, one of the nursing clients, 
we do request all their background documents. There are times when we do not get the entire set. Uh, say, for example, we get the transcript of one year or the final year. Well, that will not work. Uh, we do not get a diploma. That will also not work. So there are workarounds. We do ask for them for things that are absolutely unattainable. But then we do need those documents. Our professors do need to review all those documents when they put in, uh, you know, when they create an academic evaluation. This is because if it is not there, there is a high chance that USCIS is going to flag the evaluation. And that is going to be detrimental for the petition that you are filing. And it is not good for our reputation as well. So uh, it is of paramount importance that we get the entire set of documents. There are times when our clients feel a little annoyed about it, that there is a lot of back and forth about this. But then that's the only way that we can make your academic evaluation accurate. And as I said, RFE proof. Right. And um, the final thing, of course, it is always advisory in nature. Um, whatever we try to bring in or whatever the professor is trying to attest, it is finally depending on the adjudicating officer to accept the evaluation or not. But if we take care of all the other things as the policy states, there is a high chance or probably a 99.9% .9 chance that your academic evaluation will be accepted. Okay. So yes, I was talking about the different types of uh, academic evaluations. We usually in this industry, we have two different types of academic evaluations. One is the document by document and the other is the course by course. These names themselves are quite explanatory, um, but I would like to expound upon them a bit. Uh, document by document evaluation is a more general academic evaluation. Uh, it looks at the documents, the documents that are provided by the university are reviewed and an equivalency is drawn. Uh, course by course evaluation, um, uh, it is more dependent on the coursework that you have completed, the credits that you have been granted, and of course, the grading, the grading scale of the university for that program. So a lot depends on that. Uh, for you, I mean, for as a nursing client, what would be the basic difference? The basic difference would be the time. Uh, course by course evaluation, because it delves deeper into your coursework and an analysis of it, it will take longer time. Usually I have seen that it is like seven business days is the minimum that I have seen, but it can go as long as 12 weeks as well. So it can be a longer process in terms of getting one. And of course, it is expensive. It is, um, it is way more expensive than the academic evaluations that we provide. Right. Um, there are also differences in terms of the actual documents that are required, uh, which I will talk in the next slide. But yes, for the document by document evaluation, we require mainly these three kind of documents, your degree certificate, your transcripts and the certified English translations. If these documents are in any foreign language. Now, why do we require all these three? The transcripts for all the years of the study need to be brought in. As I said before, if it's just the final year, which states that you have finished the third year of the study, or if you have finished the fourth year of the bachelor's, that wouldn't suffice. The reason, um, the professors look into the coursework that you have studied from, the, from year one. There are also other reasons. For example, you got credit transfers from some other universities. So that is shown in a transcript. You might have done a program that, you know, um, that allows you a lateral entry into your current program. That is also shown on a transcript. So these are things that the professors do look into, and therefore we require the entire set of documents. The degree certificate, the diploma certificate is absolutely necessary because that is the one statement that says that you have actually completed the entire program. You might have completed the examinations, but there might be some other things that are required for the partial submission, partial com completion of your program. But the degree certificate tells that, OK, you have completed everything that is required for a program. So that is one key difference between the document by document evaluation and the course by course evaluation. I mean to say that a document by document evaluation can be done only for completed degrees, completed academic programs. That is not the case. That is not necessarily the case for a course by course. Uh, you can still submit um, uh, uh, a program which is in progress or something that you abandoned, you know, studying or you just decided not to pursue. Those can also be submitted for a course by course evaluation. But a document by document evaluation will consider those years of study as years of training, not actually academics. 
right? So that is a key difference between document by document and course by course evaluations. So um, the set of documents that is required for course by course is, is mainly the transcript uh, and the coursework and the course, the credits that you got. But in this case, we do require a certification that you actually completed the entire program in its entirety. Yes, so uh, Beth, am I going too fast? No, I think you're doing great. I think um, let's go back one slide because I do want to ask one question yeah. that you talked about about these specific documents. Oh, okay, um, yeah. uh, right there. And this is something maybe you're going to ask at the end. But as we ask the, the these certificates be sent over, is there a place in Carnegie that allows everybody to upload these documents? Do they have to come directly from the school? What is the best way that someone can get these documents to Carnegie for the evaluation? That is so much, so much a, qu a pertinent question. Uh, we get this question from our clients so much. Um, we just require it, a copy of them. We don't require the originals. We don't require university to provide us. But there, ha there are a number of universities, particularly in Africa, who do not send their transcripts to the beneficiary or to the person. In such circumstances, the beneficiary or the client has asked us, can you give us an email where our school can send you the documents or can you give us an address, a physical address where our school can send you. And we have received so many couriers like that, uh, which contain the transcripts. But for our purpose, it's just a copy, just a digital copy through email that will serve the purpose. Um, we do have an online portal. Uh, through which, of course, um, we get the, uh, the evaluation requests, there is a possibility of uploading the documents from that, uh, from that portal itself. Uh, just in case it is, it is cumbersome to, to upload the documents, please do not worry. Let the, uh, the, the, the online request get submitted and you will get an automatic reply. And uh, you can always write back to that email. Uh, you know, submitting the documents. So um, we always have our email open to all the uh, clients once uh, uh, an evaluation request is submitted through the portal because every client gets our email and they can always reply back to that. They have questions, they can always write back to that through that email. All right, mm -hmm. excellent. Yeah, and that's very helpful because as you can imagine, um, even from the chat that we're seeing, we have nurses, nurse aides, so many people from around the world, which means there's so many different universities, everybody would submit it differently. But by putting the power in the nurses' hands and the healthcare mm -hmm. professionals' hands, it allows them to kind of help control how they do this. And I will share for everybody, um, the majority of the people on this call today have um, contracts with Worldwide Health Staff Solutions, mm -hmm. and we'll guide you through that. But we also have a link on our website where you can actually take you right to Carnegie. You can submit all of these documents, pay directly with Carnegie, and it just makes it so simple. You don't have to have a contract with Worldwide to be able to do that. So if you're wondering if your education would meet the U.S. requirements, you can send this in on your own to start this process. So that's really helpful. Thank you for that. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, okay, what does an evaluation contain? Um, these are the specific things that are discussed in an evaluation. And it would be very beneficial for our clients to know as to you know what are the things that are basically discussed and what is the importance as to why these are discussed. Um, applicant's name. We do not go about the date of birth and stuff, but then yes, applicant's name. This is important because the applicant's name will be used as per the diploma, what, what, what is there on the diploma. In the event that a client requires it any way different, say suppose somebody got married, somebody had a sex change, somebody just didn't like their name when they grew up, you know, they wanted to change it. Yes, please give us any documentary evidence of the, the, the name change and then we will have it in that name. Uh, if it is so important that your name has to match the name in the petition, please give us that document and that will be uh, looked upon. Uh, there will be a section in the academic evaluation that discusses the documents that were submitted to the professor for review, based on which the academic evaluation was created, right? As I said before, 
um, this is important that these were the documents that the professor actually reviewed, right? So um, uh, if it is something that is missing here, the professor actually, you know, <laughs> the burden is on the person now and not the professor because that's what he has reviewed. Nonetheless, USCIS will create an issue if they feel that the, the academic evaluation was not supported by appropriate documentation. So all the documents that have been submitted to us will have a reference in the academic evaluation. The dates of attendance, yes, the years and you know the the, the 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 exact years of your attendance will be mentioned. The location of the institution from where you have taken this program that will be mentioned. I will discuss about the institution a little more in the next slide, but I will wait for that. Uh, the next point in terms of the profile of the institution and programs. This is. This is a little more uh, in-depth discussion, and I will take it up in the next slide. Um, and finally, the recommendation of the U.S. equivalency. Now, this is the outcome that is that is required, right? The outcome in terms of what is the U.S. equivalency that you will provide for this foreign education. Now, how does a pro uh, our professors uh, come to this kind of uh, conclusion? Um, Yes, the professors are professors, so they do come up, they do come with a certain expert understanding about the US uh, education system. Uh, besides that, they also refer to a number of resources that we have subscribed to. Um, we have databases that uh, let us know about the, the accreditation status of various universities. We have uh, um, uh, information regarding the education systems of followed in various countries. But here I would like to highlight one key resource that we follow, which is Acro Edge. Now, Acro, Acro is an acronym of a very long name, so I, I just don't remember that. But EDGE, EDGE is the Electronic Database for Global Education. Now, we refer to that very closely because USCIS uh, bases all their recommendations or, or bases all their conclusions on that. Right. So uh, Acro Edge is one key resource that our professors are uh, uh, do have access to. Uh, in Acro Edge, we do have information on various credentials at the same time as to as a recommendation of what they're equivalent to in the US. But I would also like to let my audience know that not all recommendations will be taken by our professors blinded. You know, they will just not take it like that. Uh, there are reasons because, say, for example, there are um, three year bachelor degrees that are equated to a bachelor's degree in the US. But unfortunately, USCIS does not accept that. USCIS is, is very, very uh, strict about the duration of the program and they require four years come what may, uh, for a bachelor's degree. So th though there is a recommendation of that kind in the ACRO, our professors do not have to follow that, do not follow that, because that will not be um, uh, an immigration uh, tailored uh, academic evaluation. So yes, we, our professors do uh, follow ACRO edge very closely. At the same time, they are very careful that um, our academic evaluations are tailored to the immigration needs. All right. Let me ask you a question about that one. So just to confirm, um, if you have a bachelor's degree in your mm -hmm. country, we'll say it's a bachelor in nursing degree, but according to the EDGE standards, which is the database that says, well, according to this standard, it only qualifies for an associate degree in the United States standard then the equivalent, the education evaluation would say it's an equivalent associate's degree. Yes. That, okay. But for all of those who are um, joining us today, you can still work in the United States with an associate's degree in nursing. So it would not affect your nursing status. You could still come. You could still keep the same job that you were hired for, even though your equivalency stated uh, maybe it's an associate's versus a bachelor's degree. Yes, um, absolutely. Uh, I would not have uh, been in a position to say that, Beth. Uh, thank you for uh, um, chiming in. But yes, uh, I, I am going to expound on that a little more in my next slide as to why uh, certain bachelors or certain degrees um, their country doesn't happen to be the same equivalent in this country. Uh, so there are reasons for it. And that is what I am going to explain in the next one. Yeah. And um, so many of our nurses, I will I will just add, so many of our nurses do get concerned if it comes back as a lesser degree. Yes, yes, um, yes. But as a nurse myself, I have my bachelor's in nursing, actually. 
as well. But you can still work in the United States with an associate's degree in every state um, and be, get your NCLEX passed. So it's yes. not a concern. Yes. Um, there are certain countries from where we, we do get emails of this kind, the one that you said, and we feel that, you know, they get the feeling that we have not treated them fairly. They have studied so much and, you know, and at the end of it, it is not equivalent to what they think it was. Um, so yes, I would definitely talk about that uh, in my second point here. But the first thing that I would like to uh, talk about would be the status of the institution. Now, uh, for an academic evaluation, it is necessary that the institution from where you have obtained your uh, program or your degree or diploma has to be accredited. It has to be recognized by the countries, by that country's education system or the vocational education system. It is absolutely necessary. Uh, if it is not, then that will not be considered as an academic program. It will be considered as, as a training. Right. So uh, for this to be equated to something in the country, in the U.S. as an academic program, the accreditation status of your institute in that country has to be established. For this reason, our professors do look into, I mean, they have various digital sources. We have subscribed to certain databases, as I said, that gives us the information about universities across the world. Now. Uh, a good number of uh, evaluations that we get are not degree programs. They are non-degree programs, right? Uh, they are mostly diplomas. Uh, you have nursing aid programs, um, enrolled nursing programs. Now, these are not actually offered by universities. And there comes the problem for us. Because getting information on the accreditation status of a university is far easier than getting to know from, uh, getting to know information about the similar kind of information about uh, a hospital nursing school. Right. Uh, the hospital exists. You will find um, a website for the hospital, but it doesn't say whether the nursing institution that is sponsored by that hospital is accredited or not. So um, there are some times when, you know, we, we try to struggle with it. Uh, and for these reasons, we also ask for traditional documents that establish that the education that they have obtained from that hospital school is accredited. Usually it is a registration certificate from the nursing council. Uh, if the nursing council of that country tells us that, yes, uh, this person is a registered nurse and this person obtained the education from this school, that is fine with us. If, if the nursing council of, an, of a country accepts that education, it is acceptable to us as well. So there will be some kind of workarounds if we do not um, get to know exactly whether it is an accredited institute or not. And we will be seeking additional information from our nursing clients. So that is of um, great importance in an academic evaluation. This is discussed. And for this, we, our professors, will, find info, will ask us to find the information from the clients. Mm -hmm. The second point is entrance criteria to the program. Now, this is the main reason why um, our nursing clients do not get the equivalency exactly the same way as it was in their country. Uh, I will take the specific example of um, proficiency certificate from Nepal um, or the diploma of nursing from Pakistan. This, the, both these programs are solid three years of nursing education. There is no reason why anybody should doubt that it is not equivalent to a diploma of nursing in the US. But unfortunately, the country, Nepal and Pakistan, allows the prerequisite as a 10th pass so anybody who has finished their 10th grade can enroll into the program. So the curriculum is so created that it matches the, the intellectual quotient or the learning ability of a 16 or 17 year old and not a 20 year old. So it's for this reason that it is equated only to a high school pass. The proficiency certificate or the diploma of nursing is equated only to a high school diploma in the US, right? So. A person doing a post basic bachelor's after a diploma or a proficiency certificate will only have two or three years of education in nursing. But when it comes to US, it will be only equivalent to an associate's degree or three years of undergraduate education in nursing. 
And that I understand is distressing for many of our nursing clients, but unfortunately that is how it is. You know, the curriculum of that country has been created in such a way that it can enroll 10th grade. And you know, it might be, it might be a vocational education policy of that country to enroll as many students into that program, but that's how it is. And we'll have to adhere to that kind of a policy. Yeah, and I will add, I think that has come up before, and it's very frustrating for many of our healthcare professionals. Yes. Um, I will share with a high school equivalency, um, you can work in the United States as a nurse aide, um, but you cannot work as a registered nurse with a high school equivalency. So if you have more questions around that, you can reach out to your individual case managers and they can provide you more details around that. But um, uh, a high school equivalency would not be able to work as an RN. Thank you, Beth. Um, now the next thing would that, that an academic evaluation discusses will be the length of the study. As I said, USCI's decision regarding um, accepting uh, uh, an academic evaluation hinges on the duration of the program. So the duration of the program is discussed in academic evaluation. Usually the diploma programs are three year old, uh, sorry, three year long programs uh, from, an, uh, from a hospital um, uh, institute. Bachelors have to be necessarily four years uh, and masters can be differently, I mean, um, differently uh, long. Uh, sometimes it is two years, sometimes it's one year, but it depends upon um, the other recommendations that we get from various other databases. But yes, the length of the study is extensively discussed in an academic evaluation. And of course, finally, the focus area of the study. Now, why does the professor, I mean, it is a bachelor's degree or it's a diploma of nursing. Then why does the professor need to discuss the coursework? The reason why he discusses the coursework even though it is not in depth, I mean, it's not discussing about the credits provided and all, but he does discuss the coursework. There's a reason why, because it is to draw a parallel with a similar course in the US, right? So when he says that these are the coursework that the person finished, so that means to say that a similar kind of a coursework with a similar kind of um, as program is provided in the US. So that is why the major or the coursework is also discussed in our academic evaluations. So these are the four major discussions that happen in our academic evaluations specific to Carnegie evaluations. Um, and you know, uh, without which I do not think uh, uh, the academic evaluations will stand. Um, so our professors, our intake team, our um, technical team, they, they, they are very careful about getting the information for each of these four points. Okay. Um, yeah, as I said, these are the most common um, nursing equivalents that we have encountered in the past three years, uh, ever since we have started working with WWHS. Uh, diploma of nursing is the most common one that we have come across. And this is one education, one educational program that is, uh, that is available across the world. Uh, so yes, uh, the, the most that we have seen equivalent is the Diploma of Nursing. Um, associate of Science, Associate Degree in Nursing, these are similar, just the difference in terms of who provides this uh, uh, education. Uh, there are community colleges who do this kind of two-year programs that is usually um, given an equivalency of Associate Degree in Nursing. There are some universities in the world who also give out Associate uh, Degrees and they are equated to Associate of Science or Associate of Arts in Nursing. Three years of undergraduate education in nursing, very common from a number of countries who have bachelor degrees of three years. Um, so unfortunately, that cannot be equated to uh, a bachelor's degree in the US for reasons that I stated before. But yes, three years of undergraduate nursing is also very common. Bachelor of Science in Nursing, yes, the most that we have seen from is from Asia a good number of Bachelor of Science of Nursing, full four years of nursing. Uh, that is equated to the bachelor's equivalent in the country. A master's of Arts, Master's of Science in Nursing, uh, nursing, a specific specialization of nursing. Uh, it could be nursing leadership, nursing management, nursing administration, but we do have Master's of Arts in Nursing. Um, but uh, the, the important thing about, uh, thing about the master's is it needs to be preceded by a solid four-year bachelor's. Uh, unless uh, that is uh, made evident uh, through the documents, a master's of science or a master's of an arts cannot be provided. So um, these are the common equivalents that we have been providing for nursing clients. Okay. 
Okay, now, um, see, uh, when we're talking about credential evaluations, it's not just the evaluations of our academics. Uh, it is also the evaluation of your work experience. But since we work only for immigration purposes, uh, not for licensing and other purposes. Uh, there are only certain uh, visa types where USCIS allows an academic evaluation in combination with a work experience evaluation. Uh, so the specific visa kinds are um, the specialty occupation ones where it is absolutely necessary for a person to have a bachelor's degree in the specialization of his endeavor or of his position to apply without which the person cannot even apply for a specialty occupation uh, position. Now, um, that is usually a bachelor's. Uh, and for uh, the EB2, the green card variety, uh, there is a requirement that you will have to qualify for an EB2 either uh, if you are a master's degree holder or a BAU, it can be a doctorate too, or you necessarily have to be a person who has to establish that the person is of exceptionally able, exceptionally exceptional ability criteria. Now, those criteria have been established by USCIS. I'm not discussing them here because it's the outside, outside purview of our discussion today. Um, but the advanced degree qualification is something that I would like to discuss because a good number of my nursing uh, friends might be wanting to uh, come through this route as well. Um, the advanced degree discussion or the qualification is basically when a person has a master's degree. Uh, so if you have a, 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 a completely um, ed, uh, education-based master's degree, then no problem. You just provide an academic evaluation and then it's done. But the USCIS also allows an advanced degree discussion through a combination of work experience as well. Now, the, the, the rules that the USCIS has established for a bachelor degree equivalency and a master's degree, degree equivalency are completely different. For a bachelor's degree equivalency, it is a three is to one rule. Three years of work experience is equivalent to one year of academic training at the university level, right? So if the person doesn't have any academics at all at the university level, still you can provide a bachelor's degree equivalency if the person has 12 years or more. So 12 years means it will be equated to four years of academic training, and that can be equated to a bachelor's degree in a certain speciality. But that would not be the case for a master's. The master's rule specifically mentions that you need to have a bachelor's degree in a specialty, followed by minimum five years of experience in that same speciality or a very closely related speciality. So the requirement is to have a solid four-year degree, a single source for your degree, and based on which you have to work beyond five years, five years minimum, and that can be equated to a master's degree equivalency. So the rules are different, but yes, we do have clients who have come up for these academic, these work experience evaluations as well. Okay. Now I see EB2 on there. Um, is EB3 um, one of the visa types that would be able to get a work experience evaluation no. or just the EB2? just an EB2 um, okay. to an advanced degree qualification. EB3, uh, you have the professional, but those professionals have to come with a four-year single source bachelor degree. Okay. So unfortunately, it would not work for EB3. Um, I'll quickly go through the documents that we require for work experience evaluations. Um, these are a little more complex than uh, what is readily available with you. You have to procure certain documents from your employers uh, to, to, to establish your employment. So, of course, if you have a work academics, uh, you have to give us all the academic documents, your transcripts of all the years, your diploma. And if these are in the foreign language, it has to be uh, translated into English. So all the academic documents, yes. Uh, besides that, we will also require employment verification letters from your uh, current or past employers. So when I say employment verification letters, these have to be provided by either your superior or by the HR manager of that company on the company's letterhead. And these employment verification letters should ideally state certain things. Um, they should state as to when you started when you joined that company, when you left the company, so that the professor can determine the exact duration of your employment. 
Uh, besides that, it should also highlight uh, the position or various positions that you have held and the job description of each position. So the idea is to understand as to how the person progressed from a lower position to a higher position and held advanced responsibilities in the company. If it is not in the same company, the, 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 the person can have multiple employment verification letters from various employers that he has previously worked with. And the professor will look for progressive experience from these letters. So the, the, the criteria of progressive experience has to be met with when we talk about work experience evaluations. There are other conditions as well that the person has to work with peers who have similar kind of an education as well. So, um, but the most important thing is to have progressive experience. So that is, that has to be attested through the employment verification letters. Sometimes the employment verification letters are a different, are a difficult thing to obtain. Uh, so um, we settle for something called co-worker affidavits. These are notarized documents from co-workers who have worked along with you. And this in combination with some document from the company. Say it could be an appointment letter or it could be a relieving letter, something from the company that states actually that you work there. And that with the coworker affidavit will work in terms of establishing that, um, you know, your employment with that company. And finally, sometimes as a very last resort, our professors do uh, take, do, do consider resume as a supplement uh, for taking information of the job descriptions only, uh, not about the duration of the program, the duration of your uh, employment. Those need to be attested by the company itself. So uh, these are the documents that we will require for work experience evaluations. Um, we have done a number of work experience evaluations. Um, these, are, these are provided by professors who have been granted the authority to provide academic credits for work experience by their universities. So um, not every professor can do this. Uh, there's, there is an additional process in terms of um, obtaining a dean's authority letter uh, for professors who would like to uh, contribute for academic, uh, sorry, work experience evaluations. That is all uh, that I have in store for you today. I will be happy to take questions if there are any. Yeah, but thank you so much. That's such valuable information. So great for us to know. Um, we did have a couple questions that I did want to ask. Um, the first one was who submits the paperwork to Carnegie? Is it the individual healthcare professional, or is it their case manager? So we do encourage everybody to go on the Carnegie link. You can find it on the healthstaff.org website, and you can upload all those documents. You can create your own account, but that is for the healthcare professional to do. Um, how long, this will be a question for you, how long does an evaluation usually take to perform? So once all those documents are submitted, what? how long would it take for someone to get the information back? So the, the standard turnaround time is four business days. So okay. you so it's when the, the clock starts ticking when it is confirmed uh, from our end and from the beneficiary's end. So when I say from the beneficiary's end, it is the payment that we need to be, you know, we need a confirmation to the payment. From our end, we need to be happy about all the documents that has been that have been submitted. We need to know that whatever we need, we have received them. Only after that, we will send a payment link and, you know, um, we get the payment. And from that day onwards, fourth day, fourth business day, you should get your academic evaluation. Okay, wonderful. And then once you get that academic evaluation, make sure you get a copy of that to your case manager so they can get your I-140 documents submitted. That's very important. Um, does the academic evaluation ever expire? It shouldn't. I mean, I have seen petitions uh, with 2009 academic evaluations, but to be very honest, Beth, academics is a very dynamic thing in the world. Uh, universities keep changing their programs. Uh, countries keep changing their um, uh, prerequisites for various programs. I was going through one recently in Cameroon, 2021, they have changed the prerequisite for the diploma of program from 10th to 12th. So anything before that, will not be considered a diploma. It will be considered just a high school equivalent. But from 2021, it will be considered a diploma of nursing. So uh, it is always best to, to have an academic evaluation that dates just two years before. I mean, not beyond that. 
All right, wonderful. And nurses and healthcare professionals usually go back to school. It's not uncommon for them to go get additional education. And that's going to change your results. You may need to submit another one because you want to make sure that all of your education is included in that evaluation. Um, Last question is, can Carnegie Evaluations do an evaluation from any country around the world? Yes. Wonderful. So it doesn't matter where you're located. You can use Carnegie Evaluation for your evaluation. Um, I want to share with everybody on this um, webinar, first of all, thank you so much. Thank you to Dr. Zach, Zachariah, and Reno Cherian. Such valuable, such important information. Everybody that registered for today's webinar will be receiving a copy of this webinar. You're welcome to go to Worldwide Health Staff's um, YouTube page. We always post our webinars there. So much great information. Um, Dr. Zachary, anything additional that you would want to add today? <laughs> no, Reno did such an excellent job in, in really laying out this thing. And, and I think it's important um, as she stressed that, you know, when we get the right documents, our professors can provide and a very thorough, in-depth kind of credential evaluation that will really help the petitions. And and, um, uh, Reno just did ask what what ACRO-ED stood for. So I'm gonna take a minute and just say it stands for the American Association of Collegiate Registrars and Admission Officers, and ED stands for the Electronic Database for Global Education. So we need to be able to find that information in ACRO-EDS to be able to, to do this because um, USCIS uh, does refer to that. But thank you very much for inviting us, Beth. And I look forward to uh, hopefully getting some wonderful uh, peti- you know, uh, evaluations for us to review and uh, provide uh, um, evaluations for. All right, wonderful. Well, in our survey, over 60% of those attended today have submitted all their documents for Carnegie Evaluation. Thank you for doing that. We are so appreciative at Worldwide Health Staff for the service and the service it provides to all of our healthcare professionals around the world. If you would like more information about applying to Worldwide Health Staff for an opportunity to come to the United States and work, either as a registered nurse or a nurse aide, please go on our website. It's healthstaff.org. You can also refer a friend. We have some wonderful promotions going on and we are just excited to work with every one of you. If your question didn't get answered today, feel free to reach out to your case manager um, or to our website, and we will make sure we provide that information to you. Thank you so much to everyone that attended today, and we hope to see you for our next webinar. Thanks so much. Thank you, Beth. Thank you, everyone. Thanks. Thanks.